generally. Okay, um, we're ready to kick off the next session. Um, so if everyone can uh, take their seats and over to our speakers. Oh, it is bright. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, I'm Dave Connors from Constant Contact, and uh, I'm also going to be joined by Hark Newton from Constant Contact, and we're going to give you a, just a quick update on uh, our experience with Puppet over the last couple of years, uh, some of the things we learned and some of the things that uh, we're going to be uh, doing going forward as well. Um, quick background on Constant Contact. We're the market leader for... Uh, Small businesses to use online marketing tools, applications. We've been in business since the year 2000. And uh, we started with email marketing, we added survey, event management, and we've since the uh, last couple of years started to integrate social media, added social media monitoring with Nutshell Mail. Uh, and we're getting into social media campaigns and uh, relationship management as well. Our customer base, we have about a half a million paying customers are very small businesses. So these are non-techie folk. 70% um, of our customers are 10 or fewer employees. So it's micro businesses as our customer. A lot pay as little as $15 a month. And that's just important to us uh, to, as a business, we have to keep the cost per transaction very low. Um, in technology, uh, you know, we have, um, a lot of apps that make the main applications work on the order of 87 applications, something like that. We run physical data centers, one on each coast. Um, we're at some scale. You know, we're a uh, top 20 email sender worldwide, uh, consistently month over month. And about 2 million uh, transactions per minute uh, on uh, busy days. So uh, we operate at a little bit of scale. Nothing like Facebook, of course. We also uh, have a few locations. We're uh, as you can probably tell from our voice, my voice anyways, uh, out of Boston, Waltham Mass based. We have a location out in Loveland, Colorado, which is mainly a call center. And software development, small offices in Boca Raton, San Francisco, and New York City. Always looking for people like everybody else. Um, so why do we tackle Puppet? And it really came from a lot of business drivers as we started to grow in size. We've been on... Uh, online as a business since 2000, but it really wasn't until 2005, 2006 that we started to get a significant uh, amount of scale to managing the infrastructure. And uh, so that was a big driver why we started to look at Puppet. Uh, we also had several types of applications. You know, um, email is a much different application stack than survey or event management, and the social media ones are radically different than that. We started to introduce um, more and more distributed systems as we scaled, you know, things like memcache, the typical systems like that. And the culture, the way we approach software changed. We uh, adopted Agile Scrum about four years ago, and then the last year and a half or so started to move to Agile Kanban. And each of those teams really needs to have an independent capability to develop, test, and deploy their own software. So that was a challenge upon us. And we moved to a service architecture away from an EJB-based uh, architecture, and that's been a challenge. Um, but the social media and trying to integrate social media with classic uh, online marketing tools has been uh, the primary driver, just because it iterates so much more quickly, right? You know, email, survey, event management, or more like classic enterprise applications. The same rate of change, the same life cycle, you want a stable user interface, the APIs don't change. And if we're integrating with Twitter, for example, it's changing rapidly, uh, and we've got to change rapidly as well. And we've still got to maintain the service uh, uptime capability, and we've got to keep it cost effective. Remember, our customers pay as little as $15 a month. So the first thing, um, that really started to hit, as I mentioned, was scaling. We, we, we hit a couple hundred servers, and it's like, whoa, this is, this is a real challenge. And can we, it isn't going to scale hiring sysadmins to tackle this, as everybody here is well aware. So how do we get our system administrators to uh, take on this new tool? And how do, we, how do we get them to trust it? And it really is a, uh, it's winning their trust, winning their confidence in this new approach to uh, systems management. And uh, so we bit off a small piece of the puzzle 
We start with the systems administration, and let's do one small file. Let's just do resolve.conf and let that run for a couple of months. And we'll put that under Puppet Management. So that'll be the source of record. The system of record for resolve.conf is in Puppet, but that's it. All the rest of the config, they're managed in the same way they did before. The second thing was control. Control of when the change happens uh, was the next challenge for us. And, and so um, as we moved uh, more and more system files um, under Puppet, um, the administrators were still doing things the same way. They had a series of scripts, right? And they'd run their scripts, and it's a procedural approach. Puppet, with, with its declarative approach, was like, whoa, I'm, well, you know. What we did, the workaround that really got people comfort there is we allowed them to continue to push, to push the change. We used a tool called Funk, and we basically gave, uh, Puppet was the source of record, and Funk would precipitate the, the change, right? We, it would pull it from Puppet when I, as an administrator, ran the Funk commands. And that was a, a huge step forward for us, and people just over time became more and more acclimated to it and got more comfortable with that declarative end state uh, approach. Um, and then there was a major milestone for us when we finally got the first group, our male administrators, to move to daemon mode, right? Where Puppet's just running and maintaining the configuration, and if we want to make changes, we make them through Puppet and they propagate uh, on 30-minute polling or whatever. Uh, the mail system was actually a little bit easy, to be honest. I mean, the, the post fix on CentOS uh, mail farm is a well understood classic configuration, not as complex as a lot of our app server configurations, and uh, very standard across the mail farm. That said, you know, we, we look, look at this and step back a little bit. Every step of the way across every group, there was a resistance to change. And um, I, you know, most of the people here are people that really embrace change, but the predominant system administration population that we've had over time, it, it, they resist change until they get confident and um, they trust in a, a new approach. And so uh, key to doing that was, you know, to basically start with incremental change, leave the control with them, allow them to push it until they're comfortable with the pull model. And that was a, uh, how we kind of successfully rolled out across the systems administration part of Constant Contact. Um, so that improved uh, our situation in some ways. For example, you know, we were able to get distributed systems uh, much quick, more quickly deployed. So in, in one sense, our time to market, right? The business value, and I'll, t I'll take an example here. So the business problem was managing social data cost effectively was challenging because the data would maintain for a customer in our classic applications, it would be 100 times that much data in the social media space, right? Um, and the business rules around it were much different, so we had to retain it longer. How do we do that cost effectively? And the answer was Cassandra. And in our classic approach, it would have taken us six to nine months to roll that out. But leveraging Puppet and taking a dev guy and an ops guy and putting two guys on a team and letting them just run with it and work together and figure out how to do it, we're able to do it using Puppet uh, as a key piece of it in three months. So we solved it in an order of magnitude. It cost us a couple hundred grand versus about two and a half million with our classic data infrastructure solution. Big win for us, right? So, uh, you know, time to market. We were able to implement our social media tools uh, very cost effectively, but we weren't done yet, right? We'd done a piece of it. We had system administration and kind of a new technology implementation, but we still had large challenges around uh, our other Java, Java applications, you know? They were getting, uh, developers were developing it, and then they get to test systems, our pre-production systems, and there were integration issues. Oh, geez, we didn't know, we didn't have a way to test that. Uh, things like branching, all the change management that Luke talked about before, we really sh sh struggled with, and um, we had to find a way to deal with that. Never mind, you know, just overall orchestration still remained a challenge for us. Uh, before I go, I just want to embarrass these two guys here, uh, Mark Skeena and Alex Margans. It's just arbitrary, capricious, uh, embarrassing. Uh, put a spotlight on them, please. Can we move the spotlight over there? I'm <laughs> just kidding. 
So as I said, we could only go so far. The systems, the operations team had made a ton of progress. We had our kind of stuff going, but we were limited as a company to get innovation out quickly. What, was the what do we have to do next? We had to get the developers to own the configuration. And in fact, nobody in operations thought that was a bad idea, and the developers kind of want to take it on. And um, so Hawk Newton's now going to talk a little bit about how we're hand we asked them, what do we have to do with our infrastructure to make you guys successful, to own the config, to give you the ability to test and kind of test deployment uh, in your environment. And we actually put everything on the table and said, Puppet's been great for us, but if you don't think Puppet's going to work, we'll do it another way. We've been using some RPM package management to deploy stuff, also on the table. All of it was on the table. Uh, but we, we, in order to move forward as a company, to innovate more uh, quickly, Really, to survive as a business, uh, we had to figure out a better way. So we went, turned to the developer, Hawks, a system architect on the developers team. And he's going to share with you some of the stuff that um, you know, he's found in looking at this problem and how he wants to approach it. Great. Sweet. Thank you, sir. OK, so uh, we started out with, uh, with a fairly vanilla uh, puppet <laughs> implementation for our custom applications, right? Um, we kind of looked at our custom apps and said, cool, well, we know how to do Puppet, right? We got this whole Puppet thing nailed down, works great. And we tried to use the same sort of implementation strategy on our custom applications that we've used thus far for system configuration. And there were definitely challenges, uh, <laughs> many, in fact. Um, our existing uh, legacy app is this fairly monolithic implementation. Um, and so as a result, our our Puppet implementation was equally as monolithic. This um, really started to, to cause problems pretty, pretty, pretty early, actually, because there's been a, uh, an initiative to break out pieces of applications and go for more of a, more of a service-based architecture um, to, 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 to move more, more, excuse me, to move with more agility and, uh, and help satisfy the business. Um, and the, the real issue is that you know, developers like myself sits down, we, we write some code, we just jam something out, and, uh, and we, go to, we go to send to one of our managed environments, like our integration environment, for example. And we send it out there and the thing just explodes. Why? Well, because there's no puppet manifest. <laughs> Good times, right? What happens next? Well, you have to open a ticket with the operations guys, because they own puppet. This, this pattern, um, while maybe it sounds great to some people, really didn't work. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a real source of, of grief for everybody. And, uh, and the, the, it was kind of us versus them, you know, the, the, the devs against the operations guys. And uh, it, it really was a major sticking point. Um, and in fact, it wasn't all that unusual for us to push something out to the integration environment. Integration deploy fails miserably. Well, what do you do, right? I'm a developer. I can get in there. I go into the integration environment, and, uh, and I, 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 change, I change some configuration settings. Half an hour later, you've been puppet fucked, right? Everything got rolled back. <laughs> You guys, robot chicken fans? <laughs> anyway, so, and, and, and this, this was a term that we used, right? We're like, oh, we, we worked great till I got puppet fucked. Um, and so as a result, as I mentioned, there was a lot of grief and just a lot of headbutting. And it certainly wasn't the DevOps thing. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a developer. I'm in an operations conference. I kind of feel like I'm behind enemy lines, you know? Uh, but so at the end of the day, we really had to look at this and figure out what are we going to do about it? How are we going to make this really work? Um, and we started looking at, at the various options on the table. One of the things that we knew we wanted to do early was get CI working, right? It's not unusual for me to check something in late at night, and I, I break some portion of my application, which is, which is relied upon by some other app. And sooner or later, I take the entire stack down in our QA environment, right? And yeah, we're, we're a big company. We've been around for 10 years. We got some old code. We got some problems we got to fix. And uh, it was a real hindrance to say, no, we got to push the deploy back because we can't get the deploy out because we can't test it. Um, and so obviously we need, we need CI, right? No question. Um, <laughs> that's where things get really fun. Uh, so to, Dave mentioned earlier, the, the original deployment mechanism before we started trying to leverage Puppet was RPMs, right? And the devs you know, use RPMs in some cases to this day. It's not unusual for me to spin up a VM somewhere, push an RPM out to it, install it. It works great. I promote it to the integration environment. Everything explodes dreadfully. Um, and it's, it's, it was a problem. Um, and so the answer is CI, continuous integration, right? I make a change. I check it in. I put it in Git. 
Git pushes it to Jenkins. Jenkins does a build. Uh, Jenkins then pushes it out to our integration environment. We run integration tests. After integration tests have passed, then we, we declare it a, a good, solid build and push it to, push it to our QA environment. Right? That way we, we don't have the issue where we have a broken QA environment. And it, it, it looks like a really, really good idea, but we, we got a ways to go before we can get there. Um, and so after, after we uh, kind of identified that we really did have a problem, because there was a you know, kind of a back and forth, us versus them conversation around whether this was an actual problem with the way devs weren't you know, filing enough tickets or you know, uh, the operations guys aren't, aren't following up, and it was really a mess. And we, we launched, a, launched a project about 15 weeks ago uh, called Fix the Flow, right? And it was a, it, it's, in fact, it's a giant project. We have something like 87 custom applications. We got 90 developers. We got about a dozen teams. And it doesn't even talk about the ops guys, right? So it, 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 it is a very, very, very large initiative. Um, and we started out by, you know, like you would any software project, trying to gather requirements, right? What are we trying to do? Um, so we came up with kind of a laundry list. Uh, automated deployment process, right? Configuration changes should never be made uh, by hand, especially in production. Pretty straightforward stuff. It seems simple, but if you, if you adhere to it and you use a declarative mechanism like Puppet, you'd have a better place. But I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know. Uh, convention over configuration. A lot of our applications are, are written differently because that's the way we like it, right? There really is no good reason for a lot of the things that are different that are application specific. And Again, a real problem. Um, the handoff. Anytime I see a handoff, I know that we just screwed something up. Uh, we really have got to streamline the process. People own the same thing. They own the same aspects throughout the entire application lifecycle. And, uh, and, and the developers are responsible for the configuration, right? Um, one of the things that has worked with some of our classic uh, applications is that developers will actually define the configuration values for each environment. The implementation side of that is pretty nasty, but it works. It works pretty well, and, and we've enjoyed uh, some benefit from it. Uh, we want to use off-the-shelf infrastructure, right? If I'm writing code, I, I've already screwed up here. Th this is a problem that I, I certainly isn't solved, but at the end of the day, I don't, I don't need to go off and launch some giant software project to, to do something that, that we already know how to do. Um, if I do write any code, I, I want to give it back to the, back to the community. Right? It's the last thing I want to do is have some giant thing I got to maintain on top of the applications I'm trying to maintain. Um, oh, this is a good one. Uh, easy to use configuration and easy to understand configuration. Um, a lot of times for some of these more complex configuration mechanisms, you have like a series of overrides and, and sort of a, a, almost <laughs> like a waterfall effect. So I, there's, there's no easy way Looking at, looking at a particular configuration file, how the application will actually behave. Right? It needs to be very, very straightforward. It needs to be very easy to tell, single source of record. I don't have to look at nine different files and, and try to kind of extrapolate what, what, what the actual configuration values are going to be long term. So as Dave mentioned, uh, we started at kind of ground zero. Right? What are we going to do? Well, good question. Uh, we've been using Puppet for about a year, year and a half, and uh, we had real conversations about whether or not we're going to keep it. Um, and we looked at, at some of the other vendors out there and, and decided that, that, yeah, there's some things about Puppet we really like. Uh, one of the things I like the most is, is the declarative properties. If, if I have to write some, 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 some sort of procedural code to manage every possible permutation of an application, I'm going to be in deep shit. It's, <laughs> it's not going to work all the time, and we need this to work all the time. Um, there are some other things on the table, too. You know, do we want to keep using our RPMs? Um, we have, we have developers that, uh, that, that run Windows boxes and run Linux VMs inside of that. And, 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 and we kind of had a look at, at, at the entire process as well. And, and what about uh, what we're doing works and, and what doesn't. I had to work, work like a puppet thing in here somewhere. So <laughs> configuration is code, right? I hear that all the time. Configuration is code. What does it mean, right? I mean, really. I, I, it it took, took me quite some time to figure it out, because everyone seems very excited about it. And I agree, it, it sounds like a good idea. But at the end of the day, I, I think what it means is that a configuration change is equal to a code change. right? I make a configuration change, I need to test that change. Ultimately, we, we do have QA, we're not Facebook. Uh, so I need to have Facebook actually test. I mean, you know? 
<laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I mean, you know, some people can do it, some people can't. But at the end of the day, we really, we really have to start treating our application as a holistic entity. And configuration is every bit as important as the code. Right? I mean, you wouldn't normally run something in a production environment you haven't first run in a QA environment. Um, and I mean, there, there are some fairly benign things like LS, for example, that maybe you, you know, LS all over a, a production box all day long, but in, in, certain, in certain circumstances, that may go really poorly for you. I mean, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, not dev, I'm not opsy enough to tell you precisely what they are, but I expect they, <laughs> they, they involve giant file systems. Um, so extrapolate on that, right? Configuration is code. That means configuration is code, right? So configuration is software. OK, got it. We know how to write software. It's one of the things we're pretty good at, right? We got software configuration uh, and software development lifecycle all pinned down. We got this whole kanban -y thing. We're using this newfangled agile stuff. And, uh, and it, it works pretty well. Um, that means that the individual teams own their application's configuration just like they own the source code. It doesn't sound all that revolutionary, but you know, coming, to a, you know, coming to the dark side to an operations conference <laughs> and hearing some of the things that you guys have to deal with, I mean, it's insane. And, and I see the same thing happen in, 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 our, in our internal applications operations. Um, you know, those, guys, th those guys are the first and last line of defense, and they own the configuration portion of the application without having any influence on the code. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't pencil. So, as I mentioned, uh, the, the configuration is code. Well, that means that it's promoted with the code, right? We start out in an integration environment. We do an integration test. If CI passes, we push to QA. QA passes, we practice the deployment stage. That goes well, we push to production. But it is absolutely code. Um, yeah. This is a good one, right? Um, because we have so many applications, and, and yeah, everybody talks about versioning Puppet. Uh, we, we, have, we have some pretty, pretty humorous experiences in-house where we're like, oh, OK, well, I guess we need a branch. Uh, <laughs> you know, but because we have so many applications, the, the traditional, or, or at least the traditional, uh, as, as I perceive it, approach of versioning your modules directory, right? versioning ETC Puppet, really isn't going to work for us. We have way too many moving pieces. Each individual application contributes its own module. Um, and so there's just no way for us to really meaningfully kind of we're headed back to the monolith, right? We have this giant monolithic code base that, that, that gets versioned uh, together. And, and we have to stay away from that. One of the, as Dave mentioned, you know, we're moving into the social media space. And we absolutely have got to be able to move with, with a degree of agility. So how do you do that, right? I, I don't have one repository for all of my modules. I have distinct repositories. Um, the idea being that there's a tight coupling between the application code, uh, the Puppet module, uh, tests, and maybe any SQL or seed data. And that actually lives in the same place in the repository. It lives side by side. It's versioned together. It's built together. It's released together. It lives and dies together. It all happens uh, as, as one module with, with a degree of encapsulation. right? Newfangled programming term. Um, and you know, with all these apps, we absolutely have got to have the ability to make a change in one app and not influence the other ones. And to have a high degree of certainty that we've managed to do that, not, not actually manage to screw anything up in the process. Um, so I put on my architect hat and kind of had to look at the problem. And it looks to me like there are two main types of puppet modules at, at Constant Contact. There is the, uh, the application module, which describes how the application, what's special about the application, right? What, what makes it a beautiful, unique snowflake? Um, and then there, there, are the, there are the tools that that application module leverages in order to perform the configuration. What I don't want to do is, is push just like you know, raw puppets in, in, into all of the, into all of the um, individual development groups. Because that's just a recipe for disaster. I mean, we already have so many things that are different for no good reason. Now I got guys that are working in this puppet DSL, and, <laughs> and they're doing things just all together different, and there's no reason for it. So the idea, and I've, I've, I'm actually glad that I came to this conference, because I've, I've seen a lot of people doing this, is that we basically provide a set of common resources to be leveraged by the applications. 
like an Apache resource, for example. And you might say, hey, I'm, I'm application XYZ, and I need an Apache host, and I need this kind of JK mount, or, or whatever. And, and then I step back, right? Because as an application, that's what's important to me. The precise version of Apache, I, I, don't, I don't care, right? I, I don't care if you use name-based virtual hosts. I, I, don't, I, don't care, I, I, don't, I don't care about SSL certs. I mean, none of this stuff is important to me. But I, but I do have to have that somewhere. So that, that actually belongs in the common puppet module, or at least what I'm calling the common puppet module. I, I, I doubt I'm coining a phrase here, but. Um, and, and there actually is an interesting conversation around how that gets built and, and, and how, we, how we author the common set of modules. Um, I mentioned a minute ago that you know, we, we develop software, we're pretty good at it. Um, and that common module absolutely has to be treated as software. It, it absolutely has to be something that, that is QA'd, um, ultimately, that, that is released. You have, you have like a program manager or somebody that does the release schedule. Ultimately, maybe you have a PO. Maybe you have a, a product owner that goes around to the company and says, OK, what new features do we need from our common modules? Um, you, know, you, you likely need QA people that know specifically how to test these things, uh, regression tests, ultimately. It's also part of the CI. It, it, the whole thing, and I know this sounds really radical, but the whole thing is absolutely software. Am I saying that, that operations folks can't author this software? I'm, I'm not saying that. But, but I am saying that we absolutely have got to call it software or we're in, we're in deep shit. I lied. There's a third kind of module. Um, and, the, and those are the, the, kind of the classic sysadmin modules, all the stuff that Puppet is really good at that we do today and that we understand real well. Um, and, and that is absolutely in the domain of, of the operations folks. Um, but as I mentioned, there is a promotion process. Right? It absolutely goes through QA. It doesn't have to be a heavy QA. It could be an automated QA cycle. But before I actually check something into production, I test it. And then I, then I test it in the stage to make sure that my deployment mechanism works correctly. And if all that passes, then I go to production. It may not be the most popular, uh, uh, the, the, the most popular concept, and I'm certainly open to suggestions. Uh, but it seems to me, that, again, as software, we have to treat it as software. Doesn't sound like rocket science. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit here about what a custom application module looks like at Constant Contact. And some of this stuff, we're still kind of in the pilot phase. Um, again, I don't think it's all that radical. But, uh, but as, actually, as of today, I don't think it's all that radical. But, um, but it's definitely worth talking about. Developers need development environments, and we are all over the map. <laughs> we got Mac, we got Windows, we got guys running various different kinds of, uh, of virtual machines. We got Ubuntu, we got everything. And I really, really like using Vagrant in development. Because if I do it right, I can use my puppet modules that I'm going to use in my managed environments and in, in integration, QA, stage, and production in my development environment. And that's huge, right? Again, you, trying to eliminate these handoffs, trying to eliminate these, these things where, where I have to file a ticket, right? So at, at the end of the day, I, I create a module, again, a puppet module that lives in my code, that lives next to my code, that's versioned with my code. And that module is built by my build system, by my build system managed by my RE guys. And, uh, and I can leverage that module to deploy my application. The module's all inclusive. It includes um, the application deployable itself, uh, you know, the, an error or WAR or whatever. Um, it includes any, any application specific configuration. Uh, so, yeah, we are actually going to do distribution, it looks like, over REST. Since, since XML RPC went away, we don't necessarily have to use RPMs to get our code on the box. We can actually use REST, which is cool. Uh, makes things easier. It's all in one place on the Puppet Master. Um, so a, a, as an application developer, I will author a manifest. And then as part of my, as part of my daily deploy, test and deploy cycle, I'll deploy to a vag vagrant virtual machine, a, a, a virtual box virtual machine. And that's huge. Same tool in dev that we use everywhere else. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, w once I'm happy with my change, I'll check it into our, into our local GitHub uh, again. Uh, Jenkins will get a hold of it. It'll do the CI tests, push it up to the Puppet Master that eventually pushes it down to the individual agents. I kind of like the, uh, the dichotomy between Vagrant and, and, uh, and Jenkins. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. So actually, I wanted to touch a little bit on this. I think it's kind of cool. 
So we're, we actually just upgraded to 273, right? We're leading edge as far as, as, far as stable goes. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna use environments like releases. Once, once the, the set of modules is built, um, and, and it essentially is a release candidate, right? It, it is a set of software that's supposed to work well together. We push that out into an environment in ETC Puppet environments, or wherever we're gonna put it, of course it's configurable. But the point is that that, that set of modules is immutable. Right, it's delivered by CI or maybe some other mechanism, and it never changes. If I make a change to a module, it'll get built, pushed out to a different environment. So ultimately, if, if I don't have a data retention policy, I'm gonna have every single environment that I've ever considered deploying anywhere. I mean, that's probably not a good idea. He'll probably kill me, but um, <laughs> yeah. So we then can use mCollective with the Puppet D plugin, excuse me, to, uh, to tell groups of machines to change the environment they subscribe to. Um, I, I, I don't think that, I, I've actually heard of other people doing this at, at the conference. I haven't heard anyone tell me not to do it. <laughs> it's, it's a bit different, I think, than, than what environments were, maybe a little bit different in concept than what environments were originally, uh, originally meant for. But I actually think it's gonna work really well. It, it puts us in a really interesting position, so I can push a, a potential release out to my Puppet Master and I can have one of my QA environments subscribe to that release. I, I, I can use the Puppet dashboard to watch everything go, you know, the whole Ron Gold, Goldberg conversation. And, um, and if it works, great. I do the same thing with my stage environment. Nothing about the files on the Puppet Master change, right? It's, it's, merely, it's merely a question of which agent subscribed to that environment. And, and to me, that looks like a really attractive idea. Um, Kind of the, my dirty little secret is, is that we're using RPMs to get the uh, modules onto the Puppet Master, which I think works okay, but uh, I'm really not thrilled with the concept. I've never really liked RPMs all that much, especially custom ones. But um, let's see here. I think, I think that's about it, guys. Um, does anybody have any questions? Nobody? Ah, okay. So I, I believe the question was about the deployment workflow. Okay, so ultimately we've built the deployment workflow uh, into, into Puppet stages. So the, the first stage is responsible for getting the appropriate infrastructure on the box, and the second stage um, will we'll run whatever init scripts need to be run, and, and it'll actually wait for, wait for the, the JBoss, in our, in our case, the JBoss instance to come all the way up. Um, but the secret sauce is definitely stages. Um, as I mentioned, some of this stuff is still in pilot. There, there are some real questions about, about how we coordinate among several different uh, machines in a, in a pool, um, how we do pool configuration. I'm happy to hear that there's F, we're, they're working on F5 integration for Puppet, that, that's huge. Um, and, uh, and there's also other conversations about what happens if something fails. Right. I, I rather like the idea of, of, of completely freezing the deployment if anything goes wrong. I just say, yo, somebody has to come take a look at this. And then I gotta have Mark or Alex come in and, and fix my broken stuff. Um, but I definitely don't wanna get in a situation where we're flailing wildly whenever anything doesn't go exactly right. Um, that being said, I'm sure it'll work perfectly. We've tested it like nine times. <laughs> Does that answer your question okay? So M Collective has the ability, um, has a Puppet D plugin that, that will allow you to arbitrarily select groups of boxes and, and run Puppet on those boxes. Um, and you can, you can limit the, the number of total boxes that gets run, or you can limit uh, how many actually run, it, run, in, run in parallel, how many, how many Puppet runs happen at the same time. Um, one of the downsides that we're struggling with a little bit is that if you're gonna use the Puppet D plugin uh, on M Collective, you can't have a Puppet daemon running. Which, which means you have to have like the commander plugin on, on, uh, on, on M Collective to manage that for you. And I think it'll work okay. Uh, we, we, there, I think there's some high availability conversations. What happens if, if that commander process dies? <laughs> that sounds terrible. Um, but I, I think we'll figure it out. So they just kind of run whatever, whatever kind of way in the world. Well, if, if I want to get real specific, I, I, can, I can say run on this particular box and then run on this particular box. And in the beginning, that's probably what we'll do. 
Um, but later on, I might say, hey, you know what? All application servers that, ha that have this class, go ahead and do a puppet run and subscribe to the new environment. And I, and I don't want you to run more than, say, two at a time. And so you know, th th they'll do their own, their own load balancer pool manipulation. Um, they'll actually manage the deploy. Ultimately, they'll fail the puppet run if anything goes wrong. Um, and at that point, someone will have to come take a look. Any other questions? Sweet. Thanks, guys. Great job. Thanks. I didn't use it at all. <laughs> okay, so we've got um, now a short break, uh, sort of 15.